Oh, thanks, Jenny. Just just as I'm going live, Tensor yeah. guy uh, is asking me to join his Heroes of the Storm team. Oh, for the for the tournament we're in. Should I say yes without letting him know that I don't know how to play the game properly? <laughs> Uh, it, since the whole thing's just for funsies anyway, it probably wouldn't hurt if you... I know, uh, but they, they might want to win. Well, I they might. Know. They might. We annihilated our opposition yesterday to the point we almost felt bad. But, uh, it's still fun, I think, even if you lose. I don't know. It's, it's entirely up to you. All right. We're I'll having think a good about it. I'll think about it. Let's just do an entire episode of Daily Tech News Show while I think about it. Okay, all right, yeah. All right. What better way? <laughs> Hi. I'm Howard, co-executive producer for the Daily Tech News Show. Join me as a co-executive producer for only $10 a month. In addition to the fancy business cards, you will get that special feeling inside, knowing that you are supporting the creation of quality content. Go to patreon.com slash acedetect. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-c-e-d-t-e-c-t. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 8th, 2015. I'm Tom Barrett. Joining me today is Scott Johnson, the godfather of the Frog Pants Network. I come to him sometime after his daughter's wedding. Uh, Yes, sometime indeed. Uh, Hello, Tom. Hello, Wednesday, people. And hello, world. It's good to be here as always. I love coming on on Wednesdays. It's the middle of the week. It divides my life. And it's just like, eh, just wedged right where it needs to be. Look, I don't want to. I don't want to have have this uh, seem like it's casting aspersions on the other days of the week. But Wednesday is sort of like, you know, the high point in the middle. See, you go up to Wednesday. It's the hump day, right? You're up Take to the that. hump. Take that, Veronica and Justin Robert Young and whoever else. <laughs> it's also the best day on the morning stream. I have to say. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, because of your guests. Because you're there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I met Nicole Spag, but I'm there too. It's oh, true. Right. Oh, yeah, just just happened to be there as Darryl. well. <laughs> let's let's do some headlines. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella sent an email to employees announcing plans to restructure the company's phone hardware business. Up to 7,800 positions, primarily in the phone business, will be eliminated. The company will record an impairment charge for Q4 2015 of approximately seven point six billion dollars related to the acquisition of the Nokia devices and services business. That's in addition to a restructuring charge of approximately 750 to 850 million. So you're getting close to $8 billion writing down there. Uh, Microsoft spent $7.2 billion to acquire devices and services from Nokia. Microsoft will continue to make phones. They're going to make Lumia phones narrowly focused on business, low-end, and flagship lines. And Scott and I are going to, we're going to comb over this a little more in the discussion section today. For sure, and I'm very curious about the that word. That was not a Balmer joke, even though uh, it turned out to be. <laughs> Impairment charge. I want to get more into what that means and why it's so expensive. Anyway, the Wall Street Journal says, or sources at the Wall Street Journal tell them, uh, that Apple's preparing its suppliers to produce a record-breaking 85 and 90 million of its two new models of the iPhone for the year is over, according to the Business Insider India. Last year, Apple ordered 70 and 80 million units, respectively, in the first run of its iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. The next iPhone is expected to come with a force touchscreen, similar, similar to the one you see in the Apple Watch. A few other innovations have been rumored here and there, but uh, primarily the same device. That's a lot of phones, Tom. Yeah, keep this number in mind when we start talking about Microsoft later on, because Apple kind of, if this is true, the Wall Street Journal sources are usually pretty good, uh, Apple sort of bucking the trend in smartphone sales and anticipated smartphone sales. Yeah. yeah. We've been reporting on Google's struggle to comply with Europe's right to be forgotten rules. I, I guess the struggle is like how to properly report them, how to, how to let people know which links get removed. And now the next web reports that consumer watchdog in the United States uh, uh, is making sure the US FTC doesn't forget US people's right to be forgotten. I forget what we were talking about now. Oh, right. Consumer watchdog wants the Federal Trade Commission to investigate why Google has not extended the right to be forgotten to US users. Last year, FTC chairwoman Edith Ramirez told Time magazine, quote, an expansive right to be forgotten is not something that's likely to pass constitutional muster here in the United States. Do you think it's again, are we just don't forget yeah. that uh, don't forget. See what I did there? Ah. Uh, 
Right to be forgotten is not removing things that are, are uh, libel. They're not removing things that are illegal. They're removing things that are facts, but that people feel should be forgotten. I got busted in 1992, let's say. Uh, and, I, and so when you do a search on my name, these felony charges come up. I want those to be removed from Google search engine, not removed from the web, so that people forget that I was charged with that felony. Yeah, it's, it's such a touchy subject. I feel like the minute you bring it up, at least over here, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like culturally we're, gonna, culturally we're going to rebel against an idea of having something like this removed. It's almost like selective censorship, even though it's affecting, impacting potentially an individual who may or may not feel that they have the right to have that thing removed, but there's just something about it that feels anti, I hate to say anti-American, but it feels a little anti-American. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know if it's anti-American or not. I mean, I think you have a, you have a, a, a solid reason for, for saying that. On the other hand, I, it doesn't sound like the US FTC is welcoming of, of this push. I, I get where consumers, the consumer watchdog is coming from the point of view of, hey, you know what? You shouldn't have people thinking things about you that are old. And without a search engine, people wouldn't know about this embarrassing thing that happened to you in the past. And if it's irrelevant, if it's no longer ha should have any bearing on you, then, then you should have the right to make a search engine get rid of it. That's what they're saying. What the USFTC's Edith Ramirez seems to be saying is uh, the Constitution says that you get to say whatever you want up into certain limits like obscenity and, and libel. And yeah. we don't see the right to be forgotten applying to those sorts of things. I guess it's just the weird practicality of it. If I do a search for Scott Johnson and uh, let's say I'd done something terrible. I don't know, burned down a, a building. I've never done that, folks. But if I had, and I really wanted that to be in my past, it's been expunged or I've been, you know, I've done my time or whatever and I want that off a search engine, there's very small difference between searching Google for Scott Johnson, cartoonist and podcaster versus Scott Johnson, cartoonist and podcaster, and then the word fire at the end. Uh, how do they know what to block? Do I have some artwork with fires in it? Have I talked about, do I have episodes of the podcast where I mention Hellfire Peninsula and, and freaking... Well, you, what you do is you say as the person like, hey, there's these links to these old uh, Utah Journal articles about arson and me. I want those removed from any search results where people search for Scott Johnson. That makes sense. Uh, by the way, arson and me was my favorite 70 sitcom. Uh, hey, right there next to 10 speed and brown shoe. That's right, your favorite ever. Remember back in March when live streaming app Meerkat was awesome and everybody wanted to sit in, uh, sit at lunch with you and watch you do things in your life. And then Periscope came along, those big jerks, and Meerkat was like, where'd everybody go? It really did feel like overnight. That was a very strange transition. Uh, today, Meerkat rolled out major updates, including the ability to sign up through Facebook. Your sort of standard, you want to make a new account, you want to sign in through Facebook sort of thing. A new feature called Cameo that lets you hand over your stream to a viewer for 60 seconds uh, at a time. And a way to save streams to the Meerkat library, a.k.a. the cloud, instead of your phone. So uh, Meerkat, Meerkat down a little, but not out. They want, uh, they I want like that. your effete pronunciation of Meerkat. <laughs> Meerkat. Uh, you know, first of all, if they'd had the Meerkat cloud library at launch, they probably would be in better position uh, to fight off Periscope because that was one of the things people said they preferred Periscope for is you could watch a stream later. Uh, Meerkat's whole shtick was they were being like like Snapchat, right? Like, ah, oh, the stream is gone. Once you're done, it's e ephemeral. Uh, and that was kind of cool for some people, but apparently that was a disadvantage when they went head to head. But this 60 second thing is really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I would totally see, like we used to walk around Dragon Con, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and do a live stream from there. I could absolutely see something like that where you're like, okay, I'm gonna hand it over to like Scott, Scott's back in Utah, boom, Scott. And then you say a few things and I take it back. And you know, like it, it adds a level of interactivity here that I think is pretty interesting. Yeah, the only downside is it's just up to Periscope to, I feel like Periscope's in this position where they can just sort of pick and choose features either that they're working on or they see Meerkat do and then integrate themselves and try to stay on top of it because they definitely do seem to have more of the mind share. But this, this concept that this stuff should be viewed later should have been a thing from day one. I understand trying to say, well, we're capturing lightning in a bottle. If you missed it, too bad. But I can't tell you how many times I've hopped online, seen one of my friends 20 minutes ago say I'm going live on Meerkat or on Periscope, and only to find out that I missed the freaking thing. So, And on uh, Periscope, you can still go back and watch it, Meerkat. You couldn't until now. Until now.
In response to leaked internal documents from the hacking team, Adobe has issued a critical vulnerability alert regarding Flash, according to the next web. Security hole, which could allow attackers to take control of the system, exists in Windows, Mac, and Linux. Sorry, fanboys, you don't get to brag about your particular platform on this one. Adobe expects to release an update to fix the problem later today. Until then, many security researchers, including the next web, uh, which is not a security researcher, but the next web recommends disabling Flash in web browsers or enabling Flash to run only when clicked. If you want, to yeah, I saw a lot of a lot of hubbub and, hubbub and stink on Twitter about this, and um, I uh, friends who are who are loving this because they think that anytime this happens, anytime Flash has big vulnerability, is one step closer to never having to have Flash again. Oh, hey, there's the platform that fanboys can rally behind: the not Flash platform. Yeah, the one that don't want Flash, which seems to include almost everyone at this point. It includes me. I'll be frank. Uh, there you go. <laughs> the Verge reports that Logitech is dropping the tech. Whoa, sort of. Everyone's changing their logos and names lately. It's weird. The company's introducing a new brand called Logi or Logi. <laughs> I prefer Logi. The new brand will be used for future-facing stuff, unquote, especially in the Internet of Things categories. Uh, the full Logitech brand will continue to stick around for more established legacy products. You can expect that, I think, on keyboards and mice and the stuff we kind of know them for. One commenter on Ars Technica story really nailed the most important question, though. Hard G or soft G? And I was thinking Loggy or Logi, but now Logi. Yeah. Oh. I wonder if they focus grouped that. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it to me. I mean, I don't it's know. It's a little Logi. It's a little Logi or, hey, you I hawked the Logi in the parking lot or various those, other. Those, uh, those light sensors that I put in, kind of Logi. <laughs> Laggy. <laughs> Is, is how you might not good either. We don't want laggy. Like, uh, like. Yeah, they, they hired a Nokia uh, brand manager uh, away, and this is his first big project for Logitech. And, and I'll be honest, if the, the bigger part of this story is what The Verge was saying about how they're going to think of a product from start to finish when they design it, like the packaging and the way it looks. And if that ends up being a better looking stuff from Logitech, which isn't badly designed, but it's certainly not something at and go, wow, that Logitech Harmony remote is sure pretty, yeah. uh, then then this this could end up making some nice looking stuff. And I know that's important to some people. Well, one All of the, I care about personally is that it works. Yeah. And one of the advantages of Logitech is that they, they do work. They have good quality stuff in terms of functionality. It's not always the prettiest stuff, but I only buy my uh, Logitech mice, for example, for PCs, Macs. I just want Logitech mice. And I've done that for years. The only thing that's weird about that or about this is that even if it's Logi or Logi or Logi, whatever it is, it, it presumes you already think of Logitech and yet you're looking at this as the advanced brand. It's like knowing Toyota and then knowing that they also make Lexus. It's kind of like that. I and don't know. Actually, I would dispute that. I think this is an attempt for them to say, we're going to make Internet of Things products, products for the smart home, and we don't want people thinking about tech. Uh, because he said in some of these stories, tech is the past. I think it's going for the average consumer who doesn't know Logitech, who doesn't know computers, and they just see a cute little name like Logi for their for their home automation stuff. Hmm. Or they see a a Logi detector that you buy. And, yeah. your and they're just like, you know, I'll buy the rapid one, not the Logi one. Thanks. <laughs> United Airlines grounded flights in the U.S. for two hours this morning after a network outage. The Wall Street Journal reported a router malfunctioned in the reservation system, preventing verified passenger lists from being created, uh, which is something you have to have before you can take off, as well as preventing passengers from checking in in many cases. Later on Wednesday, uh, as in Gadget reports, the New York Stock Exchange halted trading for more than three hours due to a technical issue. The New York Stock Exchange Twitter account said it was not the result of of a cyber breach. This is something that the scientists call coincidence. Hmm. I was going to say, you assured me this morning on the morning show where you are a guest on Wednesdays, you assured me that this was nothing more than just simple coincidence. Did I assure you or did I say, I kind of think this? I'm starting to think chemtrails and Illuminati and all those things. So, I, I uh, think you're on some, something. I don't think you want to say the word Illuminati more than twice, though. No, or, or it'll turn into Candyman and shoot bees out of its mouth. I know what this is yeah. about. In <laughs> uh, Gadget reports, the Swiss Post, I like that name, uh, will begin, t it makes me want to have breakfast for some reason, will begin testing the commercial use of logistics drones to deliver packages this month. Test of Matternet drones. Test of Matternet. There you go. 
Uh, we'll focus on special cases like lab samples and emergency supplies. It's estimated to be five years before it becomes a common practice. Well, that's pretty interesting. Commercial use of Switzerland. Yeah. yeah. They're using Matternet drones. Matternet has experience, uh, we've mentioned this before on the show, delivering supplies by drones in Haiti during the earthquake. Makes perfect so sense, right? Like what, what, better, what better thing to have it used for than a situation where you have trouble getting other kinds of craft in there. So it's great. And time-sensitive stuff like lab samples for tests. Uh, yes, the, the Swiss leading the way in postal delivery by drone. Yeah. Go Swiss. And little marsh or, marsh in your uh, hot cocoa. Reuters reports the Delhi High Court in India has lifted the ban on Uber in New Delhi. The city had rejected Uber's license application last month. The court said the state government can impose strict conditions, but the court did not favor a complete ban. So we talked about this last Wednesday, and um, the story kind of fell away from me in terms of keeping kind of track of what was going on. But the original ban was due to what? Was that ever kind of so, sort of settled? Why? What was the consensus as to why they banned it in the first place? Oh, the, the, there was, yeah, that, that was very clear. They, they said uh, you had a rape happen in one of your Uber cars. Uh, yeah. We don't think your application is uh, up to snuff. We don't think you're providing proper assurances. So we're going to shut you down. And then Uber continued to operate. And so they started to seize uh, Uber, uh, Uber po property, Uber cars and that sort of thing. And sure. another company went before the Delhi High Court. And now you're forcing me to, with this question, to reopen this and find out <laughs> what actually happened here. Because uh, I don't remember the name of the company. But uh, uh, the Delhi High Court said it was another company in Delhi um, that went before the court and got them to to basically reverse the decision. And Uber said, hey, well, if, if you'll do it for them, you'll do it for us. And the, and the government did. And they did. But as, as far as re repercussions, I haven't heard anything anywhere in any other territories, uh, especially the states, where this seemed to bleed over and say, hey, wait a minute, what Ola. about Uber? The company was Ola. They won a similar reprieve after re a rejection of a license application. Gotcha. Well, there you go. Uh, what figure prints has done for Warcraft and Minecraft... Or did, I should say. Amazon is now doing for Smite, Primal Carnage, and Infinity Blade. Will sound familiar to you? Well, they're video games. The next web reports Amazon now uses Sandboxer to let you customize one of 35 characters from these games, have it printed and delivered for $30 to $90, depending on size. Uh, so I still have, not handy or I'd show it, but I still have a figure prints version of my World of Warcraft orc. It was uh, created right around the beginning of uh, the, the, uh, the third expansion for the game, or second expansion, technically. And at the time, we were blown away. 3D printing had not yet quite entered the stratosphere in terms of it being a common thing that you and I could go buy hardware for and, and, and print out things at home with. I, I wonder how this stuff does now, uh, you know, given the fact that you can do a lot of this stuff yourself. Not licensed necessarily, but you can sometimes make your own things. be interesting to see and it's and you, it, the way it looks like it operates, and maybe I'm misinterpreting this, you have to go in and re-customize the character. You can't just tap into the character you've been playing. Right. It's not the same as when Warcraft gave access, their database access to figure prints and said, here you go, guys, pull whatever data is happening. And the way that worked is if I wanted to have my character, I got him, the day I ordered him, I got him in the clothes and gear and stuff he was in that day, color and everything. And that's what I ended up getting printed. It sounds like this gives you a lot more options. Also, a lot less expensive. I want to say yeah, thirty it was, to ninety bucks. Yeah, it was like one hundred and thirty or forty bucks for the for the figure print. So, like anything good, I guess it comes down in price. But I'd be very curious to see how the 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 actual quality looks like when they get it and the resolution and all that. So, good on them. Some of the stories you've heard already were submitted on our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, that helps us figure out, especially on a day like today where you know, tech memes got a whole different slate of stories than Google News than any other outlet out there, except for Microsoft. That's the one that everybody was uh, reporting on. So we look at Daily Tech News Show's Reddit to kind of get an idea of what you think is important. Go in there and do some voting. Star Fury Zeta passed along Business Insider's article on a Boeing patent for a laser and nuclear-driven airplane engine. Boeing engineers Robert Boudica, James Hertzberg, and Frank Chandler filed the patent, which shows an engine firing lasers at a radioactive material like deuterium or tritium. The resulting fusion reaction, uh, a minor explosion, creates hydrogen or helium as exhaust that then exits the back of the engine to create thrust. But we're not done there. 
Neutrons from that reaction also heat the walls, which just happen to be coated with uranium-238, which heats up uh, water on the outside or, or some kind of coolant on the outside, which then is used to power a turbine that provides electricity to the lasers that then shoot at the deuterium and start a new fusion reaction. Holy crap, that sounds great. So a nuclear this... explosion made by lasers uh, <laughs> powers the engine, which also powers the lasers. There's nothing scary about anything you just said. Lasers, explosions, nukes. It's fine. It's, fine. it's actually not scary. It's a very well contained. And it's fusion, not fission. If everybody's thinking, oh, a nuclear bomb in an engine. No, it's not like that. Um, that's pretty darn cool. Nobody's pushing cold fusion anymore, folks. Let that it's work. not cold fusion. It's hot fusion. Hot fusion, baby. Uh, Hab I'm not going to say this guy's name right. Habachuka. What? How would you say this? Her name. <laughs> Sorry. Is Abituela Condulce. Oh, my gosh, dude. That's amazing. Well, that's as close right. as I can get, anyway. Pointed us to the Guardian report that a Manhattan judge has ordered Time Warner Cable to play Arcelli King $229,500 for placing 153 robocalls to her cell phone in less than a year. The messages were meant for Luis Perez, uh, who had once held the same phone number, or had once held the same phone number. King called Time Warner to make clear that she was not Perez. And this was to no avail. Time Warner even made 74 calls after King filed her lawsuit in March. Ah. Uh, Go get the it. Customer service is a wreck for these companies. Like, this is what happens. In the short term, you can say, oh, well, really, we want to use customer service to drive sales. So let's mm -hmm. focus on that. And it works for years sure. until the stories start to build up, and build yeah. up, and build up. And then they often change their uh, policies and then... I, I suppose we get excited about that, and then the cycle repeats itself, so it's fine. And that is a look at the headlines. Uh, someone's telling me Abituela Condulce is a, per, is, a, is a he, not a her. No. So I'm wrong about right. that. My apologies. Uh, I, I will wait until I get confirmation before I ever make that kind of determination again. Hey, Microsoft writing off $8 billion. Well, they're writing off $7.6 billion, and then they're taking a $750 to $850 billion or million dollar charge. Uh, here's the thing, Scott. This is both good news and bad news for Microsoft. Want to know good. why? Yes, I'm dying to know why. Why is it good? Because the well, bad is all I, I can see. What's the good? Yeah, the good news, I think, is that Satya Nadella, uh, who was never a fan of this acquisition, is finally putting it behind him. It's costly, no doubt. But he's saying, I have a vision for Microsoft. It involves making some devices, like a Surface tablet, like an Xbox. It does not involve being a phone-making company. And that's what they got when they bought the Nokia handset division. So what he's saying is, we're going to make a flagship phone because we want to show Windows Phone in its best environment. We're going to make a business phone because we've got tons of enterprise customers and we can throw those phones in as part of those enterprise deals when they're using Microsoft Azure and all our other enterprise stuff. Uh, and we can focus on, on security and enterprise management with those phones. And it makes perfect sense to do that. And we're going to make a low-end phone because Africa, parts of India... Southeast Asia still up for grabs, totally an open market that everybody's rushing into. We'd be stupid not to continue to try to roll out into those markets. But the idea in all three cases is to provide a template for other people to use Windows to make our phones because what not such an Adela, he doesn't ever come out and say this, but he's focusing on the fact that the future of revenue for these companies is in services. And you only make devices and operating systems insofar as it helps you sell your services. Uh, and to that end, Gartner has come out with a report earlier this week saying that PC shipments are going to fall. No big surprise there. Tablet sales are going to fall. No big surprise there. But they're also saying mobile phones sales are going to slow. They're still going to rise 3.3%, but we're starting to see the mobile phone device market mature. And that's not a place that Microsoft wants to be. They want to be in the growth market, not the mature market. Well, and they also seem to, it seems to support some other things we've seen. It's like a lot of talk about phones just generally not being as popular, like you said, or there's just a slowdown in the market. And part of that is you have companies like Samsung who are, who are seeing a bit of, di of a dip this year. At least they're reporting that. Par probably partially because they have so much choice out there. Now, we want choice. Everybody likes choice. We all want multiple things. But like the Nokia acquisition, they weren't just acquiring the name. They weren't just acquiring a few bits of technology or ways In to fact, build. They the didn't acquire the name. That's that's true. They didn't. Um, but when they when they made that deal, they acquired 
a huge line of phones, everything from cheap little flip and brick phones all the way up to, you know, what they built with Lumias and, and so on. And what you've done there is you've created a, 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 a potential for a giant market to come and say, well, yes, we, we, we want everything from that little entry-level $49 or free with a contract phone all the way up to your flagship with a huge camera and all that. And what's happened, in my opinion, is that there aren't enough consumers who want to upgrade as frequently as they used to. And so that, that whole line just kind of ends up being kind of idle. And you have a, you have a big, heavy manufacturing base that doesn't really have the kind of customers you want. And, you know, Samsung's finding this. Some of the bigger Android manufacturers are running into this. The only company that seems to, at least for now, not be running into this as much is Apple, at least based on their forecast for new hardware and so on. And that's interesting because in the past, plenty of criticism, from myself included, in Apple's direction saying, well, man, you just really have the one phone. This time, yeah, you have two sizes, so I guess you are shaking things up a little bit. But for the most part, if you don't count the C and some of those other things, you have basically the year after year, flagship, then an S, flagship, then an S. And now I'm starting to wonder if that was always the plan, if there wasn't some brilliantly highly paid Harvard graduate mathematician economist guy who knew that you needed to have less choice <laughs> because in the future it was going to be, there would be so much saturation. It was going to be way more incremental and less revolutionary, and therefore we will have two, two products to sell. We'll sell out of them and have a hard time keeping them in stock, and that's a way to keep making sure we're, you know, we're hitting our projections. Um, and by the I, way, that doesn't make sense what you just said. <laughs> having a hard time keeping them in stock means you're not going to hit the projections because you didn't make enough of them. <laughs> That's a good point. So that part I take back, but but you know what I mean. Like it's, it's I do, I do, like, and 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 it was a strategy, right? Uh, right? Apple's always had that strategy: make just a few of things and gamble that you've made them right, and that people will will double down on them, and that has worked. Here's the thing: I mean, not to get off on an Apple ta tangent here, though. They are ahead of the game right now. Like you say, HTC, even Xiaomi is uh, is slowing down. But they are not going to stay ahead of that game for long because that market is maturing, right? And they're on top of a maturing market. That's why they need to be able to have a successful watch, have a successful new platform on television of some sort, have other types of products coming out. And that's what Microsoft is doing here, saying, hey, let's pull back from putting all our eggs in the handset basket because that's not a great basket to be in right now. Now, uh, there is a downside to this, though, and that downside is they have gutted what was the heart of a proud Nokia. Uh, the next web points out that 2,300 people work in the Nokia plant that Microsoft acquired in Salo, Finland. They laid off 1,000 people in 2012 in a small town, and now they're about to lay off a bunch more because these people all work in the phone business. They're, a bunch of those 7,800 jobs are gonna come out of Salo, Finland. Uh, you're, you're really, I don't know if it's too harsh to say ruining a town in that case. Well, it's, a, it's a, the classic definition of a factory town. It's the, it's the one thing in town that employs just about everybody. It's a small place, and when that goes away, so do most of the jobs. And then a lot of other jobs that supported that were supported by those people making money at that job, be they restaurants or service-oriented businesses or whatever. So it has this trickle-down effect. Everybody's seen it happen. It happens in cities and in uh, countries all over the world all the time. But it is interesting to only see strategy from Satya Nadella and not a lot of talk. And and I don't know what they would say. I mean, it's it's almost like I a mean, thing. In his memo, he did say, like, we under, we we take this seriously. We know it's, you know, bad for people losing their jobs, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, he acknowledges that. It's not like he ignores it. Sure. No, he doesn't exactly ignore it. But it it is, you know, some would just say, well, this is the, these are the stakes. This is what business is. Um, but you, it is easy to, if you're not there on the ground or you're not seeing it from that perspective, it's easy to, to miss how what maybe looked like a huge injection of, of money and um, sort of corporate leadership or whatever it may have looked like when they made this acquisition doesn't look like that anymore. And it's easy to call something a quote-unquote impairment charge. Uh, what, but what it really is is a complete bailout of a failed, uh, failed idea, which, yeah. is, which is sad on lots of levels, but mostly it's sad for people who rely on this for their livelihood and now are going to have to figure something out. And I think what probably irks a lot of people is that what looks like to an outsider happened is Steve Ballmer decided he wanted to own a handset business. 
So he got his buddy, Stephen Elop, to leave Microsoft and become the CEO of Nokia to force a sale to Microsoft so that Steve Ballmer could have the handset division of Nokia. Elop went to Nokia, wrote a, a memo about how Nokia was on fire. It was an oil platform on fire. Uh, got the, scared them into selling off the handset business to Microsoft and then went to Microsoft and now has retired with a golden parachute. Stephen Elop comes out smelling great. Steve Ballmer got himself a basketball team. Uh, the poor people of Salo, Finland, they don't get all that. Sure. And, it, and that's the part I hope people pay attention to. And at the same time, again, it's businesses do this and it's the age old thing and it sucks. And maybe it's the part, it's part of doing business as a giant corporation with, with this kind of power or whatever. But I, I feel like hopefully the idea here is this will lead to a Microsoft who is less in a position to create this much, much disruption with a, with, a, with a flick of the wrist that these kinds of decisions will be, will be based more on long-term goals, bigger plans, not, I mean, I'm sure, it, I'm, I'm sure Balmer wasn't just like, oh, I should do this crazy thing. I'm sure it was more thinking than that. He but believed it, it was the right thing. It he just believed wasn't. it was the right thing, exactly. <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah. his, his reputation of being a little brash and out there and just kind of going for it kind of precedes him. So it's, it's easy to want to assign more blame to him. But all of that being said, if, it would be really nice if Microsoft saw this as, we don't want to do that again, guys. And this business just tightened up. They cleaned it up. They, they have real vision for what the future of this stuff should be. They all learn from the PC era, which is, seems like that's what everyone's doing again, is relearning what happened with the PC era and applying it to mobile and saying, wow, it's slowing down, just like the PC era. Hmm, I wonder if one day it'll be about services and not so much the hardware. Hmm, it's the kind of same exact routine. They seem like that's what they're trying to do. And if that's true, then maybe less towns like Salo Finland will will have to deal with impacts like this. And Nokia will be able to start making handsets again soon. It doesn't sound like because they sold all their factories that they'll be making them themselves. They'll be licensing designs, but yep. you will start to see Nokia phones again. And this, and that, I think that's the sad part is that you go through all of this wasted money, wasted time, wasted jobs uh, in order for nothing to change. Really. Uh, it's, I, my point here isn't to say this or that should be prevented, but that, you know, people in positions like Steve Ballmer and Sachin Adela's decisions uh, have big impacts sometimes. When they mis make mistakes, those mistakes have big impacts. Yeah, and sometimes that hubris at the time of making this decision, and I say that without a, be without a better term for it, but you know you've got the resources and the money and you're like, we need to disrupt this market and we need to just buy a giant phone maker. And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to, we're, we are going to force our way into there instead of having to lag behind and figure out a way to get back to the top. We're going to force our way into the top. That, that's probably a viable solution in lots of cases, lots of scenarios. And this one just happened to not work out for various reasons. So it's, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, 2020 and all that. But yeah. in the end, I hope something gets uh, learned. I suppose. And it's a fair point. Ian sort of brings this up in the chat room that the handset uh, division of Nokia might have been closing these plants, might have been laying these people off if it hadn't been sold to Microsoft. Yeah, there may have been a much more seismic loss of, of, of jobs. Who, who knows? I mean, that's, could the, that's the problem with this stuff. We could, people can analyze it left and right, but I don't know. The, the, the situation we're in, I just, I'm taking the more positive road, which is this gives Microsoft a chance to do right by new decisions, better future planning, smarter stuff and hopefully that means a healthier microsoft and a healthier you know business ecosystem around them all right let's uh let's let's perk things up with our pick of the day from daniel who says i feel like this community might have an affinity for firefly or serenity as i do and i recently read a piece on io9 reviewing sci-fi's new show killjoys calling it the space opera we've been waiting for since firefly Daniel says, after watching the first two episodes, I can't disagree with the review's premise. The irreverent humor, the ability of the leads to play off each other as well as off of one off characters is mal dash zoe esque Hope it is killed after one season only to have a killer movie and cult following for years or maybe that it gets renewed. <laughs> <laughs> so, says Daniel. But, you know, a few people have been telling me to watch Killjoys and I've heard mixed reviews about it. Uh, but, you know, I love having our picks of the day from all different fields. The idea of the pick here is that we can expose you to things that you wouldn't otherwise hear of from the community and from ourselves. So 
this might this might be a reason for me to go watch Killjoys. And we're with you, Daniel. Like just last night, my wife, I was reading something, and she was she's been rewatching Firefly. She's done this like four or five times, like every like all like we all do. And I've seen that movie eighteen times, which is the most I've ever seen a movie, except for maybe Empire Strikes Back. So yes, you have fans here on DTNS. Dyed in the wool, brown coats. We're ready for more. She, the final episode airs. I'm not really paying attention, so I don't even know where she is, but I'm reading my book, and I get a punch in my leg, just a, right in my leg. And I turn around and I go, what's the matter? And she says, I hate that this was all we got. And if Killjoys can just provide a tiny bit of that, I suppose sign me up. I haven't heard a thing about it, so this is, this is all good news to me, regardless. This email. Yeah. I'm going to check this out. Thank you, Daniel. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Our messages of the day come from Will from Maidenhead. Having just spent a week teaching my oldest niece and nephew how to code, I can think of two important reasons why all children should be taught the basics of programming. This is in response to Patrick Beja saying he thinks that it's important for children to be able to learn how to code, but he thinks it's overemphasized sometimes. Will says, if a person does not know how to program, then they can only use a computer for tasks that others have already thought of. Learning to code is an excellent way of teaching problem-solving skills. The issues that Patrick mentioned are certainly important, but I would argue that a child's basic computer literacy is not complete without an awareness of coding fundamentals. Oh, very interesting take on that. I kind of agree. Um, like right now, I, my kids are a little older now, Nick's 15, but he's trying to build his own video game, and he's doing it by learning the fundamentals of how to work with 3D models in Maya and then bring those into an engine like uh, Unreal or um, he's playing a little bit with um, the other one I forgot the name of, Unity, Unity 5. And now he's struck, stuck with that, oh no, I need to make these things work together. And not all the pre-made scripts are going to do it for him. So he's having to really put his, his head down and learn this stuff. And I'll tell you, it does, I can say from first-hand experience, it does wonders for teaching him concepts about logic that I wasn't going to be able to give to him in any other way. And it's also something he really loves to do. He's excited about the outcome. So it's not a thing I have to force him to, to learn and do. So I, I would agree with this person. Coding fundam fundamentals, I mean, you can define that any way you want. But this ability to get your head around what is the logic behind all of this? How are these behaviors produced? I think that stuff's invaluable regardless of what field they go into or what they want to do later. Yeah, and, and as, as Patrick said yesterday, he doesn't think that people shouldn't be taught how to code. Uh, he, he thinks it's more important to teach him about issues around technology use like privacy. And I agree with him there. I think that is important as well. Uh, I think that coding is a basic skill and that you should be introduced to it to see if you like it. And this is what I said on yesterday's show. I'm just kind of repeating myself. But, you know, the way you're taught basic mathematics, basic grammar, basic science, coding is what is either in your science or your math curriculum as one of those things that you should be introduced uh, into how it works, I think. And it helps you to understand more what those technology, what those greater technology issues are if you understand how that stuff works. I agree completely. And you're starting to see this now at schools and junior highs, high schools and college uh, entry level courses. So I think we're kind of heading that way anyway, but it's good to see people are generally agreeing with that idea. We have another Daniel. And because I didn't actually uh, copy their email addresses in. Could be the same Daniel at our pick. I don't know. This Daniel identifies himself, though, as from always warily weathering the weather North Carolina and said on Monday's show, Jonathan wrote in expressing concern about losing the benefits of manual driving. My thought is that it will not be all or nothing whenever self-driving cars hit critical mass. I see roads being split into manual lanes and self-driving lanes, similar to how we have HOV lanes now, except for self-driving vehicles, making it SDV lane, I guess. Uh, and if self-driving cars had their own possibly walled off dedicated lanes, this would reduce the risk of them having to deal with an unknown variable of the manual driver. At least on the highways, it could work that way. Maybe not in town. Uh, making it safer for both types of cars. In short, I don't see manual driving ever being replaced. After all, cars didn't replace bicycles and there are even dedicated bike lanes. Daniel. Well, that's cool. I, I, the only thing that keeps coming up in my head about all of this, even if it's all self-driving or a transition thing where we're kind of doing half and half for a while, is how are we separating them? Like, assuming that we want to, to, to be smart about re reusing existing infrastructure and not spend a bunch of money on new materials and new highways and byways, are you going to put a big wall between them? Because I don't need Jimmy John had too much beer at lunch to swerve over into my automated car lane anytime he feels like it. Well, you, have you ever seen the HOV lanes that have the concrete, temporary concrete barriers on, yeah. the, lane chain, on the lane mark? 
Yeah, so we have those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it'd be like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess if they can work that out, it, the, the trick it would be like, um, do they have the same off ramps? Is it just an extra lane on the off ramp? Like, I don't have a lot of I have a lot of questions about the logistics. Again, yeah. I, I think Daniel nails the HOV part of this because some HOV lanes here in LA have their own off ramps. Mm. Others just have a way for you to merge in. And and I'm with Daniel on this. Like there's a blend there. Obviously not everything can be changed. Like you say, some off ramps might need to be shared. Uh, street driving is never going to be separable, I don't think. However, when he says, I don't see manual driving ever being replaced, depends on what you mean by that, Daniel. I start to, to diverge from you. I, I think we get to a point where all of driving that we consider today becomes self-driving mm. at some point. Maybe it's 50 years from now, right? Maybe it's longer. I don't know. But mm. I, think it, I think manual driving becomes limited to maybe uh, little you know, short-range vehicles, golf cart-type vehicles in certain situations. Mm. I just, I, I think once if if self-driving cars prove to be uh, practical and safe, uh, then I don't see us leaving manual driving as an option forever. Well, some some have said or suggested that if you don't if you don't make it so that in rural areas, uh, or that, that that would be an area where people would be demanding, I need to have my truck and I got to drive it myself and I got to fill it with hay and do what I want with it. Yeah, and I, and I think there will be cases like that. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, that's why I said depends on what he means by uh, by ever. Uh, how you know maybe I could. Ever's, ever's a long time Tom it's a long long time it sure is uh, and we're not going to do this show forever thank goodness we're going to end it now uh, Scott Johnson can be found on the Twitters at twitter.com slash Scott Johnson he's myextralife.com and in fact he's got a book mm. yeah it's in the middle of being kickstarted if uh, I'm a little surprised how quick it went but if you would like to help out with stretch goals and you're interested in all at all in my 15 years of comics that I've created for that site over the last 15 years you can go to myextralife.com slash book and uh support it there's some great levels on there that you can get into get a copy of the book and uh support this thing i've been trying to get out the door forever we're finally doing it and uh when do i get the book you get you get it soon man soon. i want it soon um the I soon can't wait. i am really like literally seriously excited it's going to be good, and I'm, I'm really proud of it, and I'm so thankful for the support. And I know there's a ton of people who listen to DTNS who have already supported it, so just huge thanks for me uh, for doing that, and I promise to make something super cool for everybody. So there you go. And thanks to all of the folks who support our show, dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. Your support makes it possible to have folks like Scott on the show, to be able to bring in guests, to just continue to have Jenny and Roger and myself work on the show every day. We could not do it without you. We thank you so much, uh, especially to the folks who give to us regularly on Patreon and PayPal. But of course, we know that not everybody can do that. So if you're just giving us a dollar or two when you can, or just telling people about the show, that's great too. Another way to support the show is through the store at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. And we have a new DTNS shirt themed for Nerdtacular, designed by Jenny, polished by Seb Guns. And you can pick it up at Nerdtacular if you're going. Use the code two sides, and you don't have to pay for shipping. It just means that when you go to Nerdtacular, you can pick it up there. So go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Look at the new DTNS Nerdtacular shirt. It's got Nerdtacular on the back with all of our names uh, popped in there. And my name is on there. It's in the logo because my name's always in the logo. Uh, use that code two sides. No charge for shipping if you pick it up at Nerdtacular. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And you can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on alphageekradio.com. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. We even have another official video version at diamondclub.tv. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young as our guest. We'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Great show. What should we call that thing? I agree. No, don't Let's call it I agree. See. I agree is the name of the show. Done. Done. Selected. You know, selected. Uh, Scott Johnson, cartoonist and podcaster, has not burned down a building. <laughs> Yet. That we know of. <laughs> Americans. Oh, crap. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that serious. I accidentally used the FSL uh, 
template in Audio Hijack. Mm. All that means is that the wave file got put in the FSL folder. So it's all oh. good. Everything's fine. A reasonable thing to not. Nothing to see here. Uh, we're in. Uh, Meerkat is on life number two, which I like. <laughs> Get it? Cause A of lot. Cats. Yeah. Um, don't you forget about me. Americans also want to be forgotten. Never forget, unless I say so. Unless <laughs> I say so. <laughs> Remember, wait, no, forget the Alamo. <laughs> yeah, we want, we want it forgotten. Uh, forget about it, which I really like. <laughs> wow, lots of forgets. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, they come later. These are always in time order. Uh, oh, yeah, we need some voting live, folks. If you're yeah, listening voted, live, go to showbot.tv. Yeah. Give, us, give, us, give us your votes. I'm only a third of the way through levelating. Who forgets yeah, the time. forgotten? I like that. Dun, 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 dun. Not so flashy, eh? Logie Hawking up a Logie. Or Logi or... <laughs> I had not thought about Logi until Logie. you said that, Scott. Say what? I had not thought about Logie until you said it. Yeah. So like, oh, that's, oh, that's, that's a horrible that's, name. That's the first thing I thought of. Was I it? thought about writing it in to the, the thing, and then I was like, you know what? They're going to do it. It'll just come to them. And I just wanted to see if it did, and it totally did. Because it looks just like the word Yogi, except instead of a Logie. Y, it's an O. Yeah, yeah. It's super bad. Okay, good job, branding guy that they stole from another company. Maybe uh, they should have stolen higher up the chain. They I stole like... it from Nokia. Hilariously. <laughs> Hilariously. I like money for nothing and your phones are three. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm always happy with a good old-fashioned music I pun. I feel like we get a lot of Dire Straits references in these titles. That one is very elegant. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. No, no, Nokia from uh, Nokia from Nadella. Mm. No, Sacha like Mania my... is not running wide and wild in solo Finland. That's all I got. No, that's for sure. No. They're not real happy, I'm sure. Never eat spaghetti during the show because you then get immediately sleepy. Oh. Bad is that thing. what you just did? Yeah, I, I did. I took experience. the opportunity to eat lunch, and I ate leftover spaghetti. And now I feel like I'm going to dribble onto the floor. Pasta hangover. It's oh. the carbs. There's a little Logie. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little, I feel a little you bit Logie. Feel a little, Logie? Feel a little like, like a future Internet of Things project? I like product. that I kept pushing for the uh, guy spits on the street Logie definition, and Tom would keep bringing it back to the slow uh, to thing, because it was, it was a far more classy thing to define it as. I was, oh, I the Logie versus I the Logie? Yeah, because yeah. here we like call that. them Logies all the time. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. We call them loogies. Yeah, they were, they were some loogies. Loogies. Maybe that's why. For whatever reason, regionally or something, everyone here called them loogies. Huh. Horkin, horkin up a loogie was a common phrase. Oh. Horkin. Horkin. Wow. <laughs> this took a turn so fast. I blame Logitech. Sure. Logitech. tech. <laughs> yeah. Services is selling and selling is services. You know, they could just add a T to it and call it Logit. Yeah. Hey, that's not bad. See? They probably couldn't trademark that. Yeah, probably. Maybe, probably or they didn't think of it, and I just made them a million dollars. Or they should just do Logitech colon something for, like, this hot new line of home things. So Meerkat is on life number two is ahead right now. I like and that And I'm a exporting. Lot. Or I'm importing. So You're an that may be our title. No, they'll never forget unless I say so. It's pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of want to go with that one. Anyone want to talk me back into Meerkat? I don't know. I like to. Wait, I like to I like... Hold on one second. I'm going to check one thing. All right. I don't really. I'll do the export audio. Uh, I will. So one thing I will say is that never forget is a commemorative political slogan that originated after the Holocaust. So if you're cool with that, then you should go with never oh, forget. Well, now I'm thing. not. How many people really think of that that way? Uh, only the Jewish ones. No, okay, well, no, we're definitely not using that now. Sorry. Wah, wah. Annoying producer. Well, no, it's good to, to have someone who's uh, is aware of that stuff. No, just aware. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you're, you, most of you would be very unaware of a lot of the... Yeah. Horrible, unintentional slights we make on this show. Yeah. yeah. They make well, me wait from time to time, but I don't they're say actually anything. slights. Yeah, and unintentional slights. 
I mean, awkward. everything you say is a slight to yes. somebody. You mean me? Including what I'm saying right now. Yep. Probably. Mostly what, mostly Scott, what I said is a slight to Scott, jump in here. Save the angry Audrey. family from itself. I, I, <laughs> what? I nothing to add. <laughs> the angry family. <laughs> well, that's how all families are. A family that can't argue is a family that's not real. Agreed. That's not all right. I agree with Roger. You got to be able to like disagree openly. That's all it is. You just say, yeah. If you have a group of people, you don't have to dance around all the time. You don't have to walk in each other. Well, I tell you, I got that at home, and I, what I'm looking for when I come to work is just a little bit of peace and quiet. <laughs> 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 I got that. In, I got that in double time stereo. So uh, I'm assuming my argument's going to go up when my kid <laughs> reaches speaking age. Oh yeah. Dad. So that she learns the magic word no. No, 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 no. Come on sooner than you think. Yeah. <laughs> Go to bed. No. Eat your vegetables. I can't, no. Roger, I really can't wait for you to start explaining factual things to a two-year-old. I, I think it should be a podcast. I well, from you what I understand, you don't actually. Half. That's true. I I don't think you're supposed to explain everything. You just explain enough for them to do it. Mm. Is what I was told. Like That's someone, to good. someone once told me that like the problem is like everyone tries to over-explain things to kids that they don't understand. You just need to get far enough that they nod their head and do as you say. That's fair. Like, hey, the, you know, echo, the echo now supports uh, Philips Hue, the Belkin Wemo, and Wink. Wait, wh what's the Philips Hue? Is that the light changing? Light, yeah. Yeah, like the home automated light stuff. Echo, like I'm in the mood for love. <laughs> <laughs> it changes all the lights. <laughs> I just did an Echo. In I just interviewed my Echo today. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm posting it for my point five of Tell It Anyway. We I just did that. We did an interview with Alexa, Matt and I. I love that idea. Yeah. I should have thought of that. That's a great <laughs> idea. I feel like somebody's thought of it already. I'm just doing our interview with Alexa. It does feel like a thing that's probably happened, but yeah, it never occurred to me until right now. It's just our little brains and how it works. It, it's really, like all technology, a reflection of the person asking the questions. Right? Yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> and that's right. why it's eminently repeatable. She's got some pretty sweet, I will say as a plug for it, she's got some pretty sweet Easter eggs floating in there. Yeah, they're not bad. Some they're of them are nice long and meaty. Yeah. I like the uh, her her, um, her take. <laughs> her take on 2001 Space Odyssey stuff is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We found some really good gems. And we found them, like, weirdly naturally. Like, we didn't go look to a site. We didn't go, like, look up top ten Alexa Easter eggs. We just started talking to the talking to the big black sphere and uh, our cylinder and all of a sudden she just like came alive it was kind of neat I yeah. like Alexa I like her a lot it's my favorite of the voice automated voicey voice Me thing. too I've never gotten along with Siri Siri and, is okay but it's mostly for like transcription -y kind of things yeah um, and, and okay Google's alright for like searches and stuff but I really I don't know Alexa just has a very natural it always hears me and never has trouble yeah. well I think because it has seven speakers like all around the cylinder mm -hmm. um, and then I really what I really like is that it seems like she's really trying yep. like they programmed her to be very like I I'm really trying and I don't know it yet and <laughs> I just think like Alexa in a year is going to be really interesting once they have all this data of all the things we're asking. All I wanted to do is connect to more yes. other services. I wanted to work with Spotify and even Apple Music or, you know. I, I want her to understand complex sentences like, Alexa, movie reviews, give us movie reviews of, you know, Age of Ultron. Yeah, that'd be cool. It does weather and things like that so well. It'd be nice if it did that. Right, but if you ask it one exact thing, yeah. she it can really do it. If you ask a compound question, she can't quite nail it yet, and that's such a linguistic challenge. That's the part I love. It's the machine language business. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think it would be nice if when I asked it to play Def Leppard, it didn't play karaoke versions of Def Leppard. Oh song. yeah, that's so good. Sad. That the problem is that she doesn't have unsupervised learning. <laughs> right. Yet. Unsupervised learning is the machine language task of having an AI that can actually 
learn by context and by and, and by hearing more language. Supervised learning is when you label things and say this means that and that means that and anything that's not labeled doesn't get understood and any labels that are there are only get understood in that one way. Right. Sounds like you got your NaNoWriMo all planned out. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually research I did for an episode of that upcoming project that was supposed to launch July 1st but didn't. Oh. It will soon launch. Oh, it is launching soon though. Okay, good. Yeah. It will. I was afraid you were going to say something terrible. And, uh, how about that there other project that I keep asking you about once a week that I really need? Oh, who, Tom? Yeah. Oh, good, not me. What? I keep asking it for academic purposes. Tom looks so frightened. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> That's all right. It starts with a P and it ends with asting. Oh, asting. you're talking about me writing a book on podcasting? Yes. Why didn't you just say that? I didn't know that was... Because like, you didn't say it. I was like, this must be a real secret. <laughs> I don't know Can what it is. Can you please just write it up? Because like, yes. people keep coming to ask me about it, and what I really want to say is, ask Tom. I say you everything I've written. Let me yeah. tell you what's funny. First of all, we should talk about art and stuff, and maybe we could make a really whiz-bang book. Yeah. Second of all, when you said it starts with P and ends with casting, my brain literally just said <laughs> P casting. Yep. Yep. Just it didn't even think I podcast every we day. We hear what we want to hear. Uh, what is that about? <laughs> uh, new series coming out of Frog Pants soon, folks. That's right. How can you pee further? Yep. Trying to pee write your further. name. No, <laughs> we can help you with that. <laughs> That's pretty uh, funny. Today is a great day. Is it? Yeah. My back hurts. I wish that didn't happen. Yeah. My feet feel better. I got to do like Tom. Tom, so when you say you sit up more, what do you? How do you remind yourself not to to slouch or do old habits? Do you have a trick? Not really. You um, just you just remember that you're doing it all the time. Yeah. In fact, it was funny. Uh, I started doing it in like May two years ago, and so Nerdtacular two years ago, some guy came up to me at breakfast and said something about. Yeah, you're sitting up straight fine because he noticed me like constantly oh. me sitting. Uh, but now it's it's kind of become normal, which just is just you are. That's what I've yeah, got. Well, and, and honestly, when it was linked to me grinding my teeth, so when I felt my teeth grinding, I knew like, oh, I'm I. That's I guess that was the reminder oh. at first, just being more aware of that. I'm going to get the thing next tomorrow's many of the many doctors, the week of many doctors. I'm going to get my mouth fitted for one of those like sleep things. Oh, I got one of those that I like to call the sexy mouth. Yeah, it's hot. When you put it in at night, you're just like, I look like an idiot. No, you look like a, you look like a linebacker. You got like a football guard in no. there. Is it is it a night guard? It's a night guard. Yeah, and then you wake up in the morning with like stale drool in your mouth and you're like, you married me. <laughs> like, All those things are great. They I are love great. those. I, I have, have an open bite. Problem. If I didn't have one, I'd be, my molars would be gone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I have the same problem with my lower front teeth are, were whittling away. Because uh, I, yep. I guess I meticulously got grind those, not like a big general jaw grind, but just wow. like at those. So he made me do it and it's been the best thing ever. It totally stopped me. From doing I think it. independent podcasting might be a, like a, a grinding situation because every single podcaster I've talked to who makes their living fully from podcasting grinds their teeth. Well, I, my dentist said that anybody who works in j uh, any kind of job at all where there's any kind of pressure, which sounds like everyone <laughs> everywhere, right? Yeah. Use a mouth guard is what he's Yeah, who's not doing that? His hey, point, Amazon you know Echo just sent me an email. You can yeah. set it up with your Wink Hub compatible devices to turn on things like your stereo fans and office lights. Yeah, I got the same email. So, I'm gonna do my actual Alexa sent it to I me don't with. have any Wink Hub devices. Mm. Well, then forget it. I kind of want to get another Alexa for the office, because now I miss her when I'm gone. Alexa, add yeah. chocolate chips to shopping list. <laughs> it's funny. It's the first device like that I've thought about getting multiples of too. Yeah. At the I, time, I, couldn't, I couldn't even get the one. So. Well, you know what I really want. Now I don't want to. Do that. Actually, what I really want is I want an Alexa app for my phone so I can say Alexa and then it goes that it's connected to well, the. No, there is. There's the Amazon Echo app, right? Why right. doesn't that respond to Why voice? Why doesn't that have a voice command? That's the next thing. They made an SDK for app developers to put 
the Alexa voice recognition into their apps. Put it in your own app, Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bet they will. Yeah, yeah they probably will. You, it is a nice feeling. There's something about Alexa. Here's what I think it is. Okay, we so are setting off so many people's Amazon Echoes. Right I know. Now. I'm sorry uh, about that lady. Um, that's really nice is that I think with the, the rise of smartphones and anyone who's not a total audiophile, I think maybe we lost the concept of a central audio device because I don't have a tuner in my house anymore and I don't have like big, speakers and so like the idea of this central audio device that also talks back to you is really quite lovely and I think we we've, we've missed that centralized music I mean look everyone who really loves music has that but, I have it um, I know I don't I don't I might I mean, have to get rid of it though somewhere along the way I lost the tuner I actually keep a tuner because it's the only way I can listen to the radio while I do work and I still like listening to the radio mm. I don't know why I just do. Yeah. I think it's because I think I'm missing out on all the local ads and stuff. The that ads? Color. The yeah, you know. News. news or ads, both. Hmm. They're all ads to me. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> news is just paid for, Tom. It is. Wake up. <laughs> what, do you think your traffic's brought to you free? No. I don't think so. Uh, well, folks, uh, I think we've come to the end of our, sh our post show. So thank you for joining us, and uh, stay tuned for a brand new Sword and Laser later today after the following ads slash news slash ads. Can't tell the difference anymore.